PC, accounting for your future. Hi, my name is Steve from APC and I'm the course director. So now let's look at the Islamic finance in your paper F9 as well as your paper P4. So Islamic finance, that means you can get this money from the Islamic bank. So that's the whole idea behind it. But the question is where not you can get those money from the Islamic banks? Well, that would depend upon quite lots of things. For example, the risks of your uh, company or perhaps your activities that you're undertaking. So, for example, if you're selling alcohol, tobacco, and also uh, in the, for example, the porn industries, I mean, those activities are not allowed according to the Sharia. I mean, Sharia is just to be the laws and regulations in, in those, I mean, Islam countries. And of course, if you want to raise finance from the Islamic bank, of course, uh, those activities that you're undertaking should be allowed according to Sharia laws and regulations. So that's the idea behind it. So in this particular presentation, we are going to focus upon two particular issues. First of which, we will look at the differences between the traditional bank and also the Islamic bank. And secondly, we will look at the financial instrument. I mean, what do I mean by financial instruments? It's nothing fancy. You've studied before the source of finance for your business entity. You can either get the debt finance or the equity finance. I mean, that's the same idea behind the Islamic finance. Of course, we'll detail that when we come to it. Don't worry. Now, first of all, let's see the differences between the traditional bank and the Islamic bank. So, traditionally, if you want to borrow some money from the bank, let's say $1 million, of course, Bob approach to a bank and the bank lend a million dollars at 5% of interest to Bob. And that means from Bob's perspective, Bob is obliged to pay for this 5% of interest payment to the bank in each and every year. And from the bank's perspective, of course, the bank is entitled to those interest income of 5% in each and every year from Bob. So from that perspective, then after Bob has got this money, which is at 5%, of interest, of course, Bob simply lend this money to Jim, for example, let's say, at 10% of interest. So by doing so, without doing anything from Bob's perspective, Bob can immediately earn 5% of interest income by borrowing his money from the bank and lending this money to Jim directly at a higher interest rate. But you might have a question, well, Steve, uh, why? Jim is not going to approach to a bank and borrow at 5%. So you can think about it this way. Perhaps Jim is in the high-tech industry. Jim is a startup company, hasn't got many of his tangible assets to back up the, uh, to back up the loan. And hence, of course, the bank refuses to lend his money to Jim, for example. And hence, from that perspective then, Jim, of course, is very, very risky, has to borrow some money uh, from others or other alternative at a high interest rate. And of course, Jim surely can borrow this money from Bob at 10% and also lend this money to Tony at 15% of interest. And as you can see, the money compounding again and again, traditionally at 5% of interest, but now at 10% and finally 15%. As you can see, when increasing the interest rate from 5% up to 15%, it will also increase the cost of capital from Jim and Tony's perspective. Uh, in this case, from Tony's perspective, his cost of capital of raising the finance is extremely high. And as a result of it, what if Tony finds it very difficult to pay back this money to Jim in the first place? Because Tony can't make any profit out of it. And of course, it has to go bankrupt. And if that's the case, then of course, Jim does not have enough money to pay back to Bob. So Jim also has to go bankrupt as well. And finally, the bad debt occurred between Bob and the bank. So that's how economic crisis happened in 2008, because interest is allowed in those traditional banks. But from the Islamic bank's perspective then, 
the interest is not allowed because from the Islamic Bank's perspective, we view those interests is just to be a compounding tool. Of course, you can get this money without doing anything. You can earn the gain by lending this money to others. Yes, you can absolutely find you can do that. But this is quite risky. And that's the reason why, from the Islamic Bank's perspective, if Bob opposed to the bank and borrows the money from the bank, and the bank lend $1 million to Bob, of course. First of all, the Islamic Bank has to um, scrutinise uh, Bob's activity. Whether or not your business activities are allowed according to the Sharia. So, for example, if Bob is in the porn industry or perhaps is selling alcohol or tobacco, of course, those are not allowed according to the Sharia. So, Bob cannot get this money from the Islamic Bank. And secondly, instead of charging the interest each and every year, what the Islamic Bank is going to do is to share the profit together with you. So, that's the, that's the idea behind it. Okay, so... Uh, when talking about the summary related to the Islamic Bank or the Islamic Finance, first of all, interest is not allowed. And of course, according to Sharia, interest is called RIBA, R-I-B-A for short. Okay, so interest is not allowed. And secondly, the Islamic Bank is entitled to share the profit losses together with you. Uh, so that's very, very important stuff. And thirdly, um, the activities that you are undertaking are restricted by the Sharia. So that's very, very important stuff as well. So um, we know the difference between the traditional bank and the Islamic bank. So now let's take a look at the different sources of finance from a business entity's perspective. So that's, uh, we're going to focus upon the Islamic financial instrument. So basically, it will be divided into two modes they will be the same as you can think about in this way. We can either raise the Islamic finance either using debt or equity. So that's what I mean by fixed income mode, which means the debt finance, the equity mode, which means the equity finance. And there would be five instruments that we are going to learn in this particular section. So when looking at the debt finance, we focus upon, for example, the Murabaha contracts, which means if you want to buy something, borrow some money from the bank and buy something, you have to sign a rather hard contract with the Islamic bank. Secondly, the lease contract is Jara. And thirdly, Sukuk, which means the debt finance, uh, that debt instruments that your company is going to issue. For equity finance, first of all, we'll look at the Mudaraba contract. And secondly, Musharaka contract. So let's detail first of all for the debt finance. So, Murabaha contract. So that means for the Murabaha contract, um, if you were to buy something, for example, if you want to buy a Ferrari sports car, traditionally what you need to do then is, for example, you are Bob, you go to the bank, and then the bank lend you $1 million after uh, assessing your credit status. And after you've got that money, what you can do, perhaps you can use this money in somewhere else, and perhaps you will buy this car directly from the seller or the dealer. In this case, it's Jim, and then the ownership of the car transfer from the seller to you. That's from a traditional perspective, but from the Islamic Bank's perspective, if you sign the Murabaha contract with the Islamic Bank, so first of all, then um, you sign a contract with the Islamic Bank for the Murabaha contract. Uh, you want to buy a car, for example. So after you sign this contract with the bank, the bank will approach to the dealer, which is Jim, to purchase the car on behalf of you, rather than allowing you to purchase the cars directly. And then, of course, the ownership of the car will transfer from the seller to the Islamic bank. And finally, the Islamic bank transfer the car to you. And of course, according to the Murabaha contract, the bank is entitled or is obliged to disclose the cost related to this car and also the profit that the Islamic Bank has made as a result of it. 
So that means, of course, the Islamic Bank has to disclose both of its cost and uh, the profit element to you, which is the cost plus profit basis, or you can call it as the market basis. Okay? So that's the uh, Muraba Hal contract. Secondly, let's look at the lease contract, is Jara. So that means if you uh, lease the asset, so first of all, if you want to enter into the Jara contract, first of all, this asset must be tangible. And secondly, the lessor bears all of the risks and rewards related to this asset. So that means uh, if you uh, lease the asset from a lessee's perspective, we are not uh, bearing the risks and rewards of this asset. For example, the asset is stolen by somebody else, or alternatively, uh, I mean, I cannot sell this asset to somebody else to generate the reward or return. So from that perspective then, yes, that's the Jara contract. So from the source perspective, I have all of these risks and rewards uh, related to the asset. Okay. So thirdly, Sukuk, which is the debt instrument. So that means uh, if you issue a debt instrument traditionally, uh, what you need to do then is, for example, from the issuer's perspective, I sell this debt instrument to somebody else and the buyer buys it. And from the issuer's perspective, that means in effect we are borrowing some money from a buyer and as a result of it, we have to pay for the interest and expenses each and every year to that buyer. So of course from a buyer's perspective, they're entitled to those interest income each and every year. But when you are entering into the Sukuk, um, I mean contract with the Islamic bank, so what that means is, first of all, the, from a buyer's perspective, if you buy that bond from the issuer, the asset attached to that bond belongs to you. And surely you've got that right to earn the profit as well as the cash flow of that particular asset if it ends into a Sukuk contract from a buyer's perspective. So that's the uh, Sukuk contract according to Islamic finance. So now let's look at the uh, equity finance on the right hand side. First of all, Mudaraba contract. So, in essence, you want to start a business or you want to do a project, for example, and hence you enter into the Mudaraba contract. So that means both of these investors who provides the money into a project or business, and also management, so management uh, is only responsible for the day-to-day -day running of the business. It's not responsible for providing money into that project or business entity. So uh, the investor provides the money and management provides the expertise into that business entity. And if you earn a profit after running your business, for example, of course, the profit needs to be distributed according to the pre-agreed ratio into that Mudaba contract. For example, according to the Mudaba contract, investor is entitled to 70% of the profit, management is entitled to 30% of profit. Yes, if you earn $10, $7 needs to be distributed to the investor and $3 di uh, distributed back to the management team. But what if that business entity incurs some losses? So if you incur some losses, we cannot distribute it according to the pre-agreed ratio because according to the Islamic con uh, finance contract for this uh, Mudaba contract, it's said only for the investor will bear the losses only. That means the investor is entitled to that 100% of the losses. So management is not responsible for it. That's what I mean by Mudaraba contract. And the final contract that we are going to look at is the Mushawaka contract. So in essence, it's like the joint venture. So that means, very, very similar to before, two investors would cooperate with each other and set up a business entity, put his money into that entity or the project, and sign the Mushawaka contract. And at the end of it, if the business entity makes profit, of course, it would be distributed on the pre-agreed ratio according to the Mushaka contract. For example, 40 to 60%. So for example, if you earned $10, of course, I'm going to distribute $4 to Master A and $6 to Master B. Alternatively, if you've got make profit, it can be distributed on the capital basis or capital proportion basis. 
So that means in this case, as you can see, we put three and seven into the business, and hence if we make ten dollars, I'm going to distribute three dollars to Master A and seven dollars to the Master B. Okay, so that's the idea behind it. But what if you incur some losses? Of course, the loss will be distributed according to the capital contribution into the business venture. In this case, of course, it's 30 to 70 percent only. Okay? Right, so that's it. So that's the Islamic finance. Uh, I hope you're happy with it. Just to recap, in this section, we talked about, first of all, for the difference between the conventional finance and also the Islamic finance. We know that riba or interest is not allowed. And secondly, we've talked about the debt finance as well as the equity finance related to Islamic finance. I hope you found this very, very useful from, uh, to exam. Uh, so hope to see you uh, in the later studies. APC Accounting for your future